essentially two relationships that Jesus said everything every duty of man hangs on these two one is your love for God and what's your love for your neighbor and of course love is a relational term it's not an emotional term you might feel emotion it's always nice if you do it's a lot easier to love people if you feel loving toward them but even if you don't feel loving toward people you're still required to love them which is not the feel not a feeling but it's a relationship uh, pattern it's what you do. Uh, of course, we all know that Jesus said that the great commandment is to love God and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But that second commandment, he also summarized in Matthew 7, 12. He said, what you would have others do to you, do that to them likewise. This is the whole law and the prophets. Well, he'd already said that love your neighbor as you love yourself is the law and the prophets. It's the same, same command, only put differently. To say, love your neighbors yourself, everyone knows that. In fact, everyone knows the other form too, because they've called it the golden rule. But many people don't realize that that's what it means to love. To do to others what you want done to you. It's, loving is doing. Loving is seen in what you do, not in how you feel about it. And uh, feelings, that's, that's a different thing than love. Love is a choice. And the reason we know that is because you can be judged by God for not loving. You can't be judged by God for not feeling something because you don't have control over your feelings. You, you have to control your feelings in the sense that you don't let them run your life. You control yourself, but you can't make feelings go away. Feelings come unbidden. Feelings come and go. You sometimes wish you had certain feelings, you can't make them happen. You wish you didn't have other feelings, you can't make them go away. That's not Emotion is not what we're called to be concerned about. Because emotions are transient things. Emotions are the most transient, the most shallow part of our lives. Because your emotions can change in the next five minutes. But you, your character, your convictions, your patterns of life don't change in the next five minutes. Uh, emotions can go up and down all over the place. And I'm not saying emotions are bad. I'm just saying that many people live their life in the emotional realm. They credit their emotions with validity. If they feel that something about a person, they assume that that's the way they're supposed to look at that person. Uh, if they're feeling down, they feel like they have reason to be down. Sometimes they do, but not always. Sometimes you don't even know why you're feeling down. But the thing is, even when you're experiencing the joy of the Lord, that doesn't always manifest itself in the exuberance and bubbly happiness that, that you feel when everything's going great and when... Uh, all is as you wish it were. Emotions are not what we're talking about when we're talking about love. We're talking about relational patterns. Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, but that he lay down his life. That's something you do. You do to others what you would want done to you. It's, it's a doing. It's not a feeling. And so, love is really simply the pattern of uniquely Christian relationships. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Well, people can't tell how you feel about each other necessarily, but they can tell how you behave, how you treat each other. And it's the pattern of relationship that makes up the uniqueness of the Christian community. One of the weaknesses of the church, perhaps maybe, well, I don't know if it's the only one, but it's certainly a major weakness of the church, and people notice this at times and comment on it, is that there's no longer the sense of community that there was in the early church. People didn't consider that what they possessed was their own. They, they helped the poor among them. They, they served each other. They laid down their lives for each other. This was normal. This was a community uh, pattern of the early church. The modern church is more like a religious meeting that you go to and look at the backs of people's heads and sing certain songs or maybe listen to them and, uh, and then listen to a talk and then you go back to your car and drive home and go on with life as it was before. The early church were in relationship with each other in a way that generated a unique community. It was that community life of the early Christians that made the gospel have its cogency. Because when they would preach the unbelievers outside the Christian community, they preached Christ. They preached the kingdom of God. But what they were preaching is there's an alternative society 
And we are it. God has set up an alternative society, a kingdom, not of this world, people who follow King Jesus. And when people follow King Jesus, they behave differently. And you can tell how that is by looking at the way we behave over here, this group of people who are following Jesus. The world could see that being a Christian made a difference, not just in individuals, but in the whole dynamic, the social dynamics of the Christian people, um, community. And by the way, we've lost community even in the secular realm in this part of the world. I'm sure that there's more ancient cultures and tribal cultures and things like that, that I'm just non-Western non cultures, where community is a much larger deal. But in the West, especially because of our radical independence, um, you know, we like our privacy, we don't want anyone to be nosing around in our business, we like, you know, we, we'd rather just, uh, you know, be with friends when we want to be with friends and don't want to be with people who aren't friends very long and, and then we want to get back to our privacy. And I understand that. I feel that way too. But because that is our Western culture, the sense of community that was not just present, but almost defining of Christianity, of the church in its early years, simply doesn't exist. And, and as I said, even outside the church, you know, regular secular culture had more community. People moved too much. I mean, I don't know, I don't know the names of many of my neighbors here. I think my wife knows more names of our neighbors than I do, certainly a lot more than I do. I know a few. But there was a time, and it wasn't too long ago, and it extends back almost forever before that, that people knew their neighbors because they were born on the same street. They were raised on the same street. They went to the same church. They were in the same job for their whole lifetime until they retired. They had all the same neighbors. There was, there was a sense where everyone knew what was going on in each other's lives. Something that would make us feel uncomfortable probably today, just because, again, we like our privacy and our independence. But... This was something that made society, uh, it's something God designed, is for people to be in relationship. And community is a network of relationships, but the, the relationships in the Christian community were to be distinctive. Jesus indicated that this love that people have for each other would be the way that others would know that we're Christians. And again, they don't know it because we say, I love you, or we, or we, uh, we hope they can tell what our emotions are, but because we lay down our lives for each other. It says in 1 John chapter 3, in verse 16, uh, Hereby we know love, because Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Laying down our lives for each other, and that's not just meaning, you know, when it comes time for us to die. Okay, if they're going to shoot you, I'll say, here, shoot me instead of him. I'm, I'm laying my life down for him. That's, that's one way you lay, lay your life down. That's how Jesus laid his life down for us. But, but you can lay your life down for people every day simply by laying down your own rights and your own prerogatives and, and looking out for others' interests more than your own, uh, this is how, this is what loving community is, this is what loving relationships are. Now, I did many years ago a, a series, I did it many times, as a matter of fact, I used to teach it sometimes for a while I'm too, uh, on relationships, and it covered all the, well, maybe not all, but a, a wide range of aspects of what the Bible teaches about our relationships. So we have to remember that relationships is not a side uh, concern in Christianity. It is Christianity. The relationship with God, our love for God, which again isn't just our feeling. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. So loving God dictates the way we act, the way we behave. <clears throat> loving each other dictates the way we behave too. And these relationships with God and with each other can be can be as they should be, or they can be out of out of kilter. They can be marred. They can we can have alienation from people. There can be conflicts that are unresolved. There can be uh, marriages that that are a reproach to the name of Christ because of the way that they're conducted by the persons involved. Uh, there are there are many Christians who simply don't make it their priority to attend to their relationships with others in the body of Christ when this is really all that we're going to be judged by. Paul said, if I speak with tongues of men and angels and don't have love, I'm nothing. If I know all mysteries and have understand all knowledge and have all faith to move mountains, if I have no love, it, it counts for nothing. He even said, if I lay my life, life down and give my body to be burned and give away all my goods to the poor without love, it counts for nothing. Now that's interesting because how you, you, 
why would someone give away their goods to the poor and lay their life down if they didn't have love? Well, I don't know, but Paul says if it could be done, it wouldn't be worth anything. Because you can do all those things for other reasons too. If you do it without love, it's not, it counts for nothing. Love is what God is looking for, and love is visible in relationships. If it's not visible, it probably isn't really present. Probably isn't really real. Um, and when I talk about relationships, the Bible uh, defines lots of different relationships, and it actually uh, it actually regulates different kind of relationships different ways. And I have to say that I don't think the churches teach this enough uh, because there's many churches that are full of people and the people in the church don't have good relationships with each other. When I say good, I don't mean that they're not, you know, they're not having dinner together every day, but I'm talking about they, they, don't, they don't care about each other. There are people in the church who are in need and others who have abundance and there's just no, no sense that we are one body. When one suffers, all suffer. When one is exalted, all rejoice. That's what Paul said. Because the relationships are at a low level of priority. In fact, most people, even Christians, only want to have a few relationships with the people they get along with most easily. And obviously, who wouldn't prefer that? But that's you know the easy way. That's being following Christ is not the easiest way. It's not the path of least resistance. In fact, because of sin, many people are very annoying to us, and we are easily annoyed uh, because of selfishness and sin. And this is what God is trying to eliminate from our lives and from our relationships, from our community as believers. And so this network of relationships that God has us in defines our community. And a relationship, as I'm using the term, is that area of life, it's the place where your life intersects with and overlaps the life of somebody else in terms of activity, influence, responsibility. There are people you don't have much responsibility for. For example, there's people you've never met and you never will meet, and that's not a sin, not to meet everybody. You can't meet everybody. And the people you don't meet, you probably mostly won't have much responsibility for. I sometimes feel like we, we are much more aware of people around the world than people were before because of TV and things like that, fast-moving information. Uh, and so we almost feel like we're in a relationship with you know, the people in the Ukraine when we see their suffering, the people in Gaza when we see them suffering on TV and stuff. We feel like, wow, we should be, we're, we're responsible for that. And maybe if God lays it on your heart, you are. But the truth is, you're not responsible for the needs of everyone in the whole world. If you were, then the world would be in trouble because you don't have enough resources to help everyone in the whole world. God puts you into relationship with some people. We do share, in a sense, a relationship with everyone on the planet that we're all co-stewards of the planet. And there may be times when anyone who's a total stranger to us we may intersect with their life at some point. At that moment, we have some kind of a relationship, but it's not something that defines the rest of our life. You meet somebody who's got a flat tire, someone's broken down at the side of the road, you, they're a stranger to you, and you help them out, and you don't, help, you don't see them again. You don't have an ongoing relationship, but because they're in your world, that's a point where your life and their life intersects briefly and overlaps. And, and love is the dynamic that defines the way that Christians' lives overlap with other people's lives. And yet there are relationships that are defining of, of, our, of our individual lives, like who our neighbors are, who our parents are, who our children are, who our spouses are, uh, who goes to church with us. These are people that our lives overlap theirs uh, considerably. And there are, in many cases, these relationships are the ones being neglected or we're simply not caring whether we are uh, pleasing God in them or not. And those are the areas where God is looking for us to fulfill all the law and the prophets. That is to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. And so our relationship with God, of course, is very important. But, but our relationship with God does not exist, at least not properly, in the absence of loving our neighbor. It's uh, John, in 1 John chapter 4, speaks about both relationships 
And he says something that I remember when I was young, and I first read this passage, it surprised me because I didn't quite see that it was sensible. It's 1 John chapter uh, 4, and it says in verse 20 and 21, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. John speaks of it as if it's a given, that if you, if you can't love your brother whom you've seen, then how could you, you obviously can't love God whom you have seen. I'm going to have to take his word for that. He's saying that if you think you have a right relation with God, but you don't with your brother, and you don't love your brother, well, then you don't love God. <laughs> but I didn't think when I first read this that it made much sense to argue well, obviously, if you don't love your brother whom you've seen, you don't love God whom you've not seen. I thought it's a lot easier to love God whom you have not seen than love your brother whom you've seen. Because you see all the flaws. The brother that you see is the one who uh, irritates you, is the one that you wish you could see less of. Uh, because seeing people, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to like them if they're around too much. Even a guest in your home for more than a few days uh, you know, you kind of wish they'd go away. The people you see are the ones that it's harder to love. And yet John speaks as if it's harder to love God, whom you can't see, than it is to love your brother, whom you can see. That's how he's arguing. If you don't love your brother, whom you see, how could you love God, whom you can't see, as if that's more difficult? That sounds less difficult. But that's because I think of love more in terms of emotion. It's easy for me to love God because if I, if I have any problem with it, I can always imagine all the good things about him in my mind and, uh, and, and, and just create a picture of God that's very lovable in all respects and never have a bad feeling about that. Where my neighbor, I don't have that luxury. I can't only think good things about my neighbor if he's doing bad things in front of me or irritating things in front of me. But that's the emotion of love. Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And God said, he who loves God, he's commanded us to love our brother also. So I can't love God if I'm not doing... It's easy to think I love God, frankly, because he's not visible. He's not speaking audibly to me. He's not in my face. And maybe he does some things that irritate me, but... A lot of times we don't attribute those things to him. But when my neighbor does something that irritates me, I easily attribute to him. I can tell it's him. He's in my face and so forth. So the Bible says if you really love God, you have to love your brother also. And it's, it's uh, you know, no doubt a lot could be said or a series could be taught on how to love God. But we need to have a, 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 a grasp of all the ins and outs of what it means to have love for your neighbor, to have your relationships with your neighbor, what they should be. You know, Jesus said, if you... Come to the altar to offer your gift. And of course, he's speaking in the context of the Jewish temple that was standing at the time, and the worshipers would go and bring a gift, an, an animal, to the altar. And Jesus said, if you bring your gift to the altar, and you there remember your brother has something against you. Now that means your brother, you, you've done something against him, he's holding it against you. You haven't made it right. You've ignored it. You've just let it slide. You've done something to offend your brother, He's holding it against you. You haven't resolved it. She said, well, leave your gift at the altar. Don't even offer it to God. Just go and make peace with your brother. Make it right with your brother. Then you can come and offer it to God. He's saying, basically, God doesn't want this worship from you if you're neglecting what matters most to him. And that is the relationship between your brother and you. If you've wronged your brother, you haven't gone back to make it right to him, don't bother. Don't bother coming to worship God. He's waiting for you to do what he's already told you to do and love your brother. And then, once you've done that, then come on back and you, would, you can worship God. So, this is an extremely important thing, obviously. And we know that almost all the problems in the world are due to the neglect of relationship, at least of biblical teachings about relationship. Almost every world's, almost every problem in the world is a relationship problem. Sure, there's some problems that are caused by nature, you know, hurricanes and things like that. Those are problems, and those are not a relationship problem. Although, if people continue to suffer after uh, a disaster and their neighbors don't come to their aid, that's a relationship problem. 
War is certainly a relationship problem. Crime, definitely a relationship problem. Divorce is a relationship problem. Even, uh, you know, rebellious children, uh, you know, anger and hatred between spouses. I mean, these kinds of things. Those are relationship problems, and they are the majority of the problems that the world has. Even, you know, problems in our government are problems because the people in government have a relationship to us, and it's not being, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And maybe we're not doing what we're supposed to do sometimes. The point is that where there are problems in the world, they normally are because somebody, maybe everybody involved, is actually not following biblical patterns of relationship. And that's what we need to study because this is not a small area of our Christian lives. It's pretty much the whole thing. Uh, of course, worshiping God, singing, uh, loving God, praying, these, these aspects of our vertical relationship with God, they're obviously unique parts of the Christian faith too, but Jesus already said, don't bother with that until you've dealt with this. Until you, if your brother has something against you, don't even offer your sacrifice to God. You go fix it with your brother first. <clears throat> then God wants your sacrifice. So this is an area that we are not able to neglect without great harm being done. You know, when God created the, uh, the world and the animals and all this stuff, the plants, every time he did something, or at least almost every time he did something, he said he saw what he'd done it, and it was good. He even said that when he had finished all it was all it was very good. And the first thing that was not good, that God himself said was not good, was not the devil. It wasn't the fall. It's before the fall. The first thing God said is not good is for man to be alone. He made man, but he said it's not good for man to be alone. That is man in isolation, man without relationship. Now, of course, that led to a marriage relationship, which is the fundamental relationship uh, of humanity, though not all people are involved in that relationship. They're, it's, it's an indispensable one that needs to be maintained properly uh, and if society is going to be okay. But God created a marriage, but not everyone is married. There are other relationships other than marriage. But the, the point is, man without a relationship, man alone, in isolation, is, that's not good. God didn't intend for man to be a monad, living independently of, of all others, but to be part of a community, to be part of a family. And so God said, I'm, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a, a partner for him uh, that's equal to him. Um, and, of course, when man did fall, we see it in, in Genesis 3, that the first effect was shame, because they, they knew they were naked and ashamed. Now, in, in front of each other, there's their relationship. They had shame before each other. Mutually so, they were both guilty. She had tempted him, and he had not stopped her, and he should have, he should have protected her which he didn't. She shouldn't have tempted him. She did. They, they wronged each other as well as wronging God. And they saw each other for the first time naked. They were naked before, but they weren't ashamed. That's what it says. They were naked and not ashamed. That's what the last verse of Genesis 2 says. But when they sinned, suddenly their eyes were open and they, they saw that they were naked and they covered themselves in shame. Now, there's nothing shameful about being naked, apparently, because they were naked before that without it. But when you're not innocent, nakedness is, is awkward. Now, none of us are completely innocent, so as adults, we don't get naked in front of each other. But uh, little children, when they're born, have no, have no shame about nakedness, even in their, when they're toddlers, probably almost up to kindergarten. You, you, they still run around without any clothes on and not even be aware of it. I mean, they, they only get aware of it if they get cold, I suppose, but they, they don't, it doesn't occur to them that people are seeing them naked because they're unashamed. They're, they are innocent. They're innocent. But when we are no longer innocent, we are no longer unashamed. Uh, and this broke a relationship. Adam and Eve had to hide from each other and from God. The relationship with God and with each other was broken. They didn't want to be exposed to each other. They made an attempt to cover their nakedness so that they wouldn't see each other's nakedness anymore. And, and this is obviously a breakdown 
a marring of, of the first relationship. And we see the second relationship on record, there were others I'm sure that aren't recorded, but Cain and Abel. Uh, there was a serious problem in that relationship. And uh, obviously Cain killed Abel, that's about the, as bad as it can get in a relationship. Um, but our, our spiritual life and our quality of life, I guess I'd say our quality of life, is measured by our relationships, by the quality of our relationships. People who are wealthy, but all their relationships are messed up. They don't have anyone they trust. Their marriage is broken. Their kids are alienated from them. Being wealthy is, is a small comfort if your relationships are all a mess. Because we're made to be in relationship, and when relationships are broken or marred, our quality of life is low. I dare say that anyone who commits suicide, uh, if you find out what really was behind it, it was probably a relationship problem. Uh, they didn't feel like anyone cared for them. They didn't feel like someone loved them. They wanted to love them. They, I mean, it's a breakdown in relations. And although most people won't commit suicide, those who don't often do other self-destructive things. Uh, our, our quality of life is damaged by poor quality of relations. God has the quality of our relationships to each other on his mind. It's not good for us to have none of them. And uh, it's not good for us to be uh, alienated and shamed by unresolved sin. So we have to say God wants us in relationship, in community, and he tells us how to live in community. Now, it's interesting that no human being comes into the world, as Adam did, in, without any relations. Every human being since Adam has come from another human being and for some period of time was dependent on other human beings. Children will die if they're born in no relation. If, some, if a mother has a baby and just leaves it out on the ground and leaves it, that baby's going to die. If it doesn't have human relationships, in this case parental relationships to nurture them, they die. We're not made to survive without relations. We get hardened as we grow older especially as relationships disappoint us or as uh, or we get angry at people or whatever, uh, we, we, we kind of try to build up a crust so we, we don't relate vulnerably to other people as much. We don't want people to know everything about us. We're like Adam and Eve hiding in the bushes because there's being exposed, being transparent, being uh, vulnerable is, is scary. And the devil uses that in order to distance us from each other when in fact what we need is reconciliation what we need is to get closer to each other and that's 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 how the devil prevents the body of christ from being what jesus wants it to be remember jesus prayed in john chapter 17 he prayed twice that his disciples be one so that the world will know that the father sent jesus into the world but one in what sense obviously in unity in relationship and so without those relationships, that evidence that Jesus said would convince the world that he is from God does not exist. I mean, some people might be convinced there's a God by meeting a really remarkable Christian who stands out, but uh, that's, not what, that's not how Jesus looked at it as, as the norm. All Christians living in unity, loving each other, uh, the patterns of their relationships being different, they're involved in each other's lives. They care about each other's needs more than their own. Those are the things that exhibit that Jesus is real. And by the way, you know that a lot of people out there don't know Jesus is real. I, I really have to say, I don't understand uh, the mentality of, of the modern generation, not because, not because they're worse than others, but they're just different than mine. My generation, when I was young, many people I knew, most of the people I knew, had a hunger for God and for reality and for truth and, and for connection with others. I mean, the hippie moment was about love. It wasn't the Christian version of love, but it was make love, not war. Or all you need is love, the Beatles said. You know, and that was secular. That was the secular society. They wanted love, they wanted relationship, they wanted connection, and they wanted truth, which are all things that I can't imagine anyone not wanting. And yet I do feel like we have 
a younger generation, maybe the last two generations, largely um, not interested in those kinds of connections. People aren't getting married anymore. Why? They don't trust that that's a stable thing. Well, I wonder where they got that idea. Maybe that their parents didn't stay together? I mean, how can, how can someone whose parents divorced each other after pledging lifelong fidelity to each other, and therefore at least one or both of them have cheated on the other by breaking that, that arrangement, how can a child in that feel that they can trust another person when they promise to be with them? Now, some do, and thankfully, some marriages do survive. There are people who take that risk, and it works out for them. There's others who take that risk, and it doesn't. But the point is, more and more, because marriages have broken up, and that's a relationship problem. By the way, if, if people followed the biblical guidelines for relationships, there would be no divorce. Period. Amen. There'd be no divorce. If husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church, as we're commanded to do, if women submit to their husbands as unto Christ, as the Bible commands, there'd be no divorce. And because it's, frankly, forbidden to divorce. And, uh, you know, why do, why do people get divorced? Well, they get divorced because marriage is hard. It's hard because someone, maybe both, are not really being uniquely Christian in the way they relate. I, it may be that you could grow tired of somebody, or maybe eventually find someone boring that you've been married to for a long time, without them being um, a bad Christian. But you'd never break up the marriage unless you're a bad Christian or they are. You know, somebody's not following the pattern. And when the marriage breaks up, then the kids lose, uh, lose sight of what marriage is to be and sometimes they are afraid to try it themselves. Or if they do try it, they try it tentatively. Uh, more and more kids are not. Now, I think there's something like 63% of uh, people living together now are not married in America. Uh, that's a majority, by the way. And uh, that, that was pretty unheard of a few generations ago. But this is because relationships, people have lost faith in relationships. And why have they lost faith in relationships? Because the elders, their previous generations, didn't conduct them in a biblical way. Even this is true in the church, because divorce is very common in the church as well. And that being so means that the church is guilty, certainly more guilty than the world is. Because we know, and they don't, what marriage is supposed to be. We know what faithfulness is supposed to be. We know what loving others as we love ourselves is to be. And uh, if we haven't modeled that, then that's on us. And, and, and I believe when we in the church do not love each other in a Christ-like way that exhibits Christ to the world, we may, in fact, be causing little ones who believe to stumble. I've seen a number of marriages, one of my own in the past included, where a spouse would leave, and the kids who were following God until then decided, why should I bother? Dad's not, or mom's not, you know, they, they told me about God, and now they're not following, so why should I? And, you know, to cause a little one to stumble, she said you'd best have a millstone put around your neck and be thrown into the sea. Better than that, better than to make someone stumble. And yet people are doing it all the time. Every time someone gets a divorce, they take that risk. I'm not saying no kids survive it. I've known some kids who survived it and, and kept their faith intact. But they're at risk. And uh, so Christians really need to Realize that when we stand before God, what are we judged for? We're judged for what we did. What we did in what way? Well, what we did to other people. That's really what defines our duties, how we behave toward other people. And so if we haven't learned to conduct relationships in a biblical way, we certainly will be uh, responsible for that. And we do bring a reproach on Christ when we... Uh, when we don't follow his commandments and don't follow the biblical patterns. Now, because Christ calls us to love one another, being a Christian, being a disciple, is supposed to refashion all of our relationship patterns. 
unless we happen to have stumbled on some good ones before we came to Christ, and that's a possibility because we live in a civilization that's been influenced by Christianity for hundreds of years, it's very possible that even people who aren't Christians have picked up some Christian ideas and are doing some things right, but no one's doing all things right, even Christians, and that's where our growth edge has got to be found, is how are our relationships improving? How much are they glorifying God? And we will not be able to do that as long as we're thinking primarily of ourselves, of course. We have to be thinking about the other people, because that's how Jesus did. Jesus wasn't thinking about himself when he came here to die for us, and uh, obviously that's, well, that's the model. That's the model of love. Is, you know, we don't think about ourselves, we die to ourselves. And we do it for the sake of other people. As we learn to love, this, the, the way we live is changes. And making disciples, Jesus said, involves teaching them to observe everything he commanded. And he commanded a lot of things, but almost everything is about relations. It's interesting. When you read the, the teachings of Jesus in all the Gospels, you don't find any of his teachings about, uh, or at least very little, maybe maybe. A, a verse here or there, but not much, about um, practicing religion. Um, or where he does, like in the verse I mentioned earlier, when you bring your gift to the altar, that's about practicing religion. He says, yeah, but put, put your relationship with your brother first. Jesus, all of his teachings, Sermon on the Mount, everywhere, it's, it's about treating your brother a certain way, or your neighbor, or your friend, or your enemy. These are relationships you have with people on the planet. And uh, until we are doing what Jesus said, our relationships are a reproach to Christ. And the, and the church seems satisfied with that uh, for the most part. As long as people are attending church, as long as the money's coming into the bag when the offering is taken, as long as people seem happy to be entertained there, uh, church leadership is very often okay with that. Uh, marriages can be breaking up. Uh, there can be people in the church who don't speak to each other anymore and they're there every Sunday and won't speak to each other because they're holding grudges and the leadership very seldom intervenes or even knows about it or even cares. Uh, doing church is not the same thing as doing community. But it should be because church is community. Church is the Christian community. Uh, I realize that that evolved in the centuries after the apostles were into the Christian religion. And the difference in community and religion is because community is the way you live with people. Religion is what you do on special occasions when you go to special meetings on special days and you act the way you don't usually act for a short time. God is not interested in religion, but he's, uh, he's very, very <coughs> concerned about community. And we know how much God cares about relationships by the price he was willing to pay for it. In order to restore his relationship with us, and it's hard to know why that would be so valuable to him, but it was, he was willing to die for us. He was willing to send his son to die for us. Uh, you know, he redeemed us to himself, in, to relationship. And it says in Ephesians chapter 2 that this is also the basis of us having a relationship with each other. He broke down the middle wall of partition, for example, between the Jew and the Gentile, and made in himself one new man, so making peace, it says in Ephesians 2, verse 15. That Jew and Gentile, those were groups that were alienated just by virtue of being Jew and Gentile. They didn't have to have any personal offenses. Uh, they just didn't like each other. It was a racial thing, and it was a religious thing. They had different religions from each other, too. And they just didn't like each other. Um, and so Jesus broke down that division so that they could be united in Christ into one new man. And that's something that was constantly to him, as we know, and therefore, we have to assume very valuable to him. The ministry of the church is in large part, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, a ministry of reconciliation. The world needs to be reconciled to God. And reconciliation means taking people whose relationships are broken and repairing them. That's what reconcile means. You reconcile people who have... Uh, had relationship before, but they're, they've been alienated and they've been offended and they, you know, the relationship is not what it should be and you fix it. That's reconciling two people. And where Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians 5, he says this. 
He says, uh, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, verse 17, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Our word is a word of reconciliation. Yes, in that context, Paul's saying of recon calling people to be reconciled with God. But Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, that's reconcilers, people who make peace between parties that are not at peace are reconciling, so they should be called the sons of God. People are called the sons of God because they resemble their dad. And God is a peacemaker. Paul just said, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, God had done nothing wrong to the world. The whole alienation was on the world's side. They were the ones who did all the wrong things. And yet, God was willing to die and, and pay that price to reconcile the world to himself. That's how committed he is to that relationship. And then he says, you want to be like me? You want to be sons of God? You be peacemakers, too. Uh, it says in James, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Those who make peace are sowing seeds of righteousness, which grows into righteousness. James said it, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God, but peacemaking does. And we are supposed to be sowing seeds of God's righteousness in society, and that is by being peacemakers. Now, all of us probably have had a chance to do that sometimes, and maybe all of us do it, and that's good. I'm not here to say that we're not doing what we should be doing. I don't know if we're doing as much as we should, but we need to understand that this is what we do. Anyone who's got friends who are alienated from someone else, husbands and wives alienated from each other or whatever, uh, or you just hear two Christians that aren't, aren't uh, talking to each other or, or someone who's uh, alienated from their parents or from their children, uh, to, to step in where you can and to try to get those people in the same room and to say, listen, how can we, how can we uh, reconcile this situation? That's, that's something that some people would like to avoid. Someone said, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall get their eyes scratched out. You know, they shall, they'll make enemies because not everyone wants to have peace. God wants them to have peace, but the reason many people don't have peace with other people is because they don't want it. They would pursue it if they wanted to, but they'd just as soon have that person out of their life. It's too hard, too much effort, too tiresome to try to work on a relationship that's a difficult relationship. Why not just retreat into my own private isolation or else just hang with the people who are easy to be with. Well, I'm glad God didn't do that because we were not easy for him to live with and he didn't retire, he came after us. And that's what we have to be committed to do. Because especially in the case of Christians, but I think even in non-Christians, non-Christian families are hurting because of family breakups and, uh, and you know, people are hurting because of injustices done to them on the job or injustices uh, by the criminal justice system or other kinds of things. Injustices alienate people from each other and offend people. And, and those people need to find... Um, I'd say a responsible reconciliation. Now responsible, I say, because it doesn't just mean let's just kiss makeup and hold hands and sing kumbaya, because the reason that relationships break up is because somebody has a pattern of doing things that cause such breakups. And, and nobody has taken the effort to undo that. Now every, every conflict can be undone. There's no human relationship breach or breakup that cannot be fixed if both parties care about it as much as God does. You might say, well, there's a, I, every time I see them, I just can't stand them. Uh, they can't stand me. Uh, you know, we can't ever be close. Well, there will be probably some people that you won't be close to. You're not allowed to have that, though, if it's your spouse or if it's your next door neighbor or someone that you work with or whatever. You have to, uh, you can't just... Uh, just be sour toward people because you want to be because it's easier you have to work at it you have to say this is worth sacrificing for jesus made sacrifices for it uh i'm gonna i'm gonna carry on his work i'm gonna continue what his concerns are in my life and you know if somebody has wronged you 
and you're angry about it, and they don't care, well, that can be fixed. You're both going to have to want it. But if both people want it, it can be done. A person can humble themselves. They can apologize. A person can forgive. Um, a person can say, okay, I, what I did that insulted you, I'm going to try to stop. I'm going to be mindful of the fact that that's something I need to stop doing. That's what Christianity calls us to do, to stop doing the things that damage relationships between God's children. We do not grow in isolation. Jesus prayed, Father, I pray that they might be one and that they might be made perfect in one. The word perfect means mature. I pray that they would be in unity and that in that unity they become mature. In the fourth chapter of Mark, Jesus tells about the kingdom of God being like seed that's sown that grows even when the, when the farmer's asleep. It, there's a, a forces beyond the farmer's power that make it grow. First the blade and then the head of grain and then the ripe grain in the head. I understand the head to be the gathering of the believers. The stalk, the plant itself, is the kingdom of God. But the heads of grain are clusters of potentially mature individual grains. They're not mature at first, but they ripen in the head. He says the head forms and then the ripe grain ripens, the grain ripens in the head. He said then when it's all ripe, then he puts in a sickle because the harvest is coming. In other words, the end of the world, the harvest is not going to come until God's seen whatever amount of ripening of that grain he's looking for. And that takes place in the clusters. That right? takes place in the fellowship with others. The grain reaches its maturity. I mentioned that the measure of spiritual maturity is gauged by your relationship patterns. If you're living in love, if you're doing to others what you want done to you, if you're humbling yourself before them and seeking reconciliation with them, that's a mark of spiritual maturity. But I want to give this caveat. The mark of spiritual maturity is not that all your relationships are successful. And the reason for this is because for a relationship to be successful, both parties have to want it to. It only takes one party to destroy a friendship or a marriage or any kind of relationship. It takes two for it to be successful. That's, that's the unfair thing. You know, you may want to have peace with everyone and you may be working hard at it and you may be doing all that you should be doing and that they won't be at peace with you. Um, that, that's not fair. It should be that if you put in the work, they'll put in the work and it'll all be beautiful. But that's not how it is. Relationships are two-sided. That's why not everyone is saved. Not because God doesn't want everyone saved, but not everyone wants to be saved. Not on his terms. And so there is no reconciliation between many people and God, though God would have it. And the same thing will be true of you. It says in Romans, of course, in chapter 12, verse 18, Paul said, if it is possible, as much as lies in you, live at peace with all men. That's interesting how he qualifies that twice. The, the, the command is live at peace with all people. That's conducting your relationships in the way God wants them to be done. Be at peace with everyone. But he says, if it's possible, as much as lies in you. Now, he's saying it's not always going to be possible. And the whole thing doesn't lie on your side. Because you can do everything right, and the other person just may not want to. They may not want the relationship. And it's, so relationships can be unsuccessful, even without it being necessarily your fault. In Psalm 20, or excuse me, 120, I've always liked this verse in connection with that one in Romans I just mentioned. Psalm 120, verse 6 and 7. The psalmist says, My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. I bet you've had some situations like that in, in your life. People that you wanted peace. You wanted the relationship fixed. You wanted to be live peacefully with them, but they wanted war. They just didn't want it to happen. Well, shame on them. 
Shame on not to answer to God for that. And if that is the case in some relationships that you have, that's not your fault. I, I tell you, um, when my, uh, my, my previous marriage broke up, I remember thinking, I can't teach you about relationships anymore because I have no credibility. My relationship failed. I tried extremely hard to make it work. But it was a one party can't make it work alone. But I bought a book called How to Save Your Marriage Alone. I think I, think I saw that on your bookshelf too. <laughs> it was, it was a, a book that I guess people who are trying to save their marriage when their partner doesn't want to. Get, I don't even remember who wrote it. I didn't read it because uh, it wasn't Christian, but it, it, uh, how to save your marriage alone. You can't save your marriage alone. You can help, perhaps, but you can't always succeed. But it's your effort and your determination and the patterns of your relating that you do that are the mark of your spirituality, not whether you're, not whether the partner that you're trying to be in, at peace with uh, will allow it or not. You may be for peace, and when you speak, it's obvious that they're for war. Now, I'm just going to cover a few points here and we'll be done. The basis of relationships, there's two sides of this. Why do relationships exist? What is the grounds for them? Why are they important? Well, the first, of course, is the divine grounds, God's plan for relationships. That's, to the Christian, the most important thing. The reason we have to be in relationship is because God wants us to. Uh, and God has done a great deal to make that possible. As I mentioned, Ephesians chapter 2 says that God broke down the barrier, in that case between Jews and Gentiles, but frankly, between any two people. In Christ, when people come to Christ, the barriers that would have divided them are no longer valid. God has made one new man, a body. And as Paul made it very clear in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, you know, the hand cannot say to the eye, I have no need of you. The head cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you. You can't be independent of the other people, even if they're very different than you are. A hand and a head are very different, or eye are very different. They do different things. They don't even have much overlap in function at all, but they serve the same body. And the well-being and the welfare of one is intricately involved in the well-being of the, of the others. So Paul says if one suffers, they all suffer. And this is how God has arranged things. The body of Christ has got to be mutually concerned with every member, even the ones that least resemble us. Now, you know, there's all these different denominations, and the reason they're, they separate from each other because they don't, they don't agree. They're, they're not alike in their thinking. Uh, they think differently from each other. But thinking differently from each other is okay. The Bible does not say that everybody has to think like one other person. And if, if, if we do, that person has not been identified for us. It'd be fine with me if everyone's required to agree with me and think like I think. But I don't think everyone's going to agree to that. I think they'd rather see me agree with them. So we don't have to agree with each other. We have to love each other, and we have to make sure that we uh, work to keep the peace in the relation, even if we differ. And that could have been done more than it has been attempted. I personally believe when Martin Luther disagreed with the Roman Catholic Church and they kicked him out, that didn't go well for them, for him, or for the body of Christ in general. It caused a big division that continues to this day, and that division kept dividing more and more. And the basis of that division was carnality. Because people can disagree and say, okay, you're seeing that differently than I am. I find that intriguing. Let's discuss this. I'm going to tell you why I disagree. And you can tell me why you disagree. We're going to be reasonable and try to figure this out. Maybe iron sharpening iron will bring us into agreement. If it doesn't, I'm going to respect your right to disagree with me. And you've got to respect my disagree with you. And we're going to still fellowship together. We're still going to get along. We're still going to go to church and worship together. We're not going to judge each other about it. If I can't make you see things my way, well, I don't. it's not my duty to make you see things my way. My duty may be to let you know why you should see things my way. But if you don't, I'm not responsible for making you see things my way. We can differ, but we can't divide. To divide the body of Christ is sin. And um, 
God has created the body of Christ and broken down the barriers. As far as he's concerned, there are no legitimate barriers between Christians. Now, I say between Christians. Obviously, some people's beliefs can be so far off in left field that they don't qualify as Christian beliefs at all. Obviously, not everyone's a Christian. Not even everyone who claims to be a Christian is. But many people who are true Christians have a lot of different views that aren't you know, unanimously held by all other Christians. Well, that's probably the way it's got to be, and it's not a, not a problem. Unless I've got an ego problem, and, I, and I'm threatened by people who don't see it my way. But that's my carnality then. I, I know what i got to work on. If that's me, if I say I'm threatened by you because you don't see it my way, you don't hold the same doctrines I hold, well, the, the Lutheran Church and the Catholic Church split because they didn't see the same doctrines. Now, I'm sure a lot of people listening to me would say, yeah, but this was over the gospel itself. This was not over some, some a minor thing. It was over what is the gospel? What is salvation? I'm, I'm not so sure I see it that way. I'm not, going to, I'm not willing to say that everyone for a thousand years before Luther was damned just because they held Catholic doctrines. Catholic doctrines, I have tremendous differences with. I have differences with Lutheran doctrines, too. And I have differences with Baptist and Pentecostal and Methodist and Presbyterian doctrines as well, and Episcopal, too, and Eastern Orthodox. A fair number of differences. I've got differences with all those people, but I, I don't consider myself to be uh, allowed to write them out of the family, to, to uh, excommunicate them just for having these differences. The Catholic Church should not have excommunicated Luther, and he shouldn't have had to leave. They, they could easily say, well, your doctrines certainly are a challenge to what we have thought. And, you know, but do you love Jesus? Really, I want to know, do you love Jesus? If you love Jesus, then you're part of his body. If he's your head, you're part of his body. And, uh, you know, the more we disagree, the more uncomfortable it is to cozy up to each other in the body of Christ, but still... Obligated to. And the only reason it's uncomfortable, like I said, is because of pride. It says in, in Proverbs, I think it's 1310, it says, only by pride comes contention. Not only by pride comes disagreement. Disagreement just comes as a matter of people thinking for themselves, which is a good thing to do, otherwise you're in a cult. If someone else is doing your religious thinking for you, you're in a cult. You should think for yourself. And disagreement is a result of people thinking for themselves. But strife isn't. Only by pride comes contention. Uh, you can disagree with people considerably, but if they love Jesus, you don't have the uh, luxury of cutting them off. Now, they may cut themselves off from you, and you can't help that if they do. But that's God. If God accepts them, how can I not? Do I have high sta higher standards than God has? And you have to think about this. Anytime there's anyone that you are giving up on, anyone you're saying, I just can't have a relationship with that person, uh, you have to ask, does God? Has God given up on that person's relationship with him? If he hasn't, then, you, then you're not free to. Because if he's keeping them in the body, it's the same body he's keeping you in. And it's one organism you have to love. You have to serve. You have to uh, humble yourself. You have to lay down your life for them. You don't have to agree with them. Nor do they have to agree with you. And you can't hold it against them that they don't. Agreement is not what unifies the body of Christ. On some things, yes. Agreement on who the Lord is. That's obviously on who God is. But on many, many other things, serious disagreements can exist in a, in a peaceful family. And uh, you know this in your natural family as well. You've got brothers and sisters, maybe parents, some of whom see things different than you do on some things. Maybe they're not even Christians. Maybe they're on the other side of the aisle politically. Maybe even to discuss some of those things always risks uh, alienation. Well, you learn how to, if you care, you learn how to not alienate each other unnecessarily. And you learn to forgive each other because they're family. And that's what you do with the body of Christ too. Now, the last point I want to make is about the functional grounds for relations. What, what is the basis for my relationship with any particular person? Now, I'm not talking about my relationship with somebody who, let's say, 
uh, fell among thieves on the road to Jericho. And I'm a Samaritan or a priest or a Levite walking down the road and find them. My relationship with them is I'm, I'm a co-human being. I'm their neighbor on the planet. I may have nothing more to do with them the rest of my life. And I had nothing to do with them for this, but I have an obligation as a child of God to love my neighbor as myself and do what the Good Samaritan did. But that doesn't mean I'm building a relationship with that person. Maybe, maybe it'll result in a relationship. But whether it does or not, the relationships that I'm involved in, the ones that require relationship patterns to be practiced, uh, those are relationships of people that you're going to see more than once. People you might see all the time. They might be under your roof. They might be where you work. They might be in your neighborhood. They might be in the church you go to. Uh, or they might just be people you see in, in, in you know, business places that you happen to run across them. But if you're in conversation with them, if you acknowledge each other's existence, if, you're, if your lives overlap and intersect, you have some kind of relationship there and there are some dynamics that should exist. The, the, the basis for relationships, people might be surprised, is not love per se. I mean, love is a factor. But the basis of relationship is trust. Because you can have a, a good relationship with someone that you don't feel a lot of fondness for. That's why Jesus said you have to love your enemies. Probably you don't feel a lot of fondness for your enemies. I don't think you're required to. Fondness is not what love is. You can feel fondness for people who are your enemies, but you can't trust them. You're not going to have a relationship with them if you distrust them. Marriages are based on trust. They're not based on love, though they're a lot nicer when love is predominant in them. They are based on trust. That's why marriages start out with people making promises. That's what a wedding is. A man and a woman make promises to each other. They're supposed to be able to trust them to keep those promises. When those promises are broken, that definitely challenges the relationship. But you cannot trust somebody. I should say you can't have any kind of relationship with somebody if you distrust them. If you believe they're going to stab you in the back when you turn your back. If they believe they're going to break every promise they make. You're just not going to, you're not going to be involved. You can't. And trusting people is not a command. But, it, but if you don't trust people, it's gonna, you're not going to have much of any, of any kind of relationship. We're not commanded to trust people. In fact, trusting people, we're warned against that in the Bible. Cursed is he who puts his trust in man, Jeremiah said. And, you know, men are not trustworthy and women are not. But you can't have no relationships and you can't have a relationship if there's no trust at all. There are people that you know you can't trust. And frankly, there's not much you can do about it. You can't relate with them. And because they're just not going to be, they're not going to carry their side of the relationship. You can try to keep winning them over. Try to get them to the point where they're, they feel that they should be trustworthy. But uh, without any trust, you're not going to have a friendship. You're not going to have a marriage. You're not going to have a relationship with your parents if they distrust you and you distrust them. Uh, so trust is a very important part of that. Uh, another is humility. You will not succeed in relationships without humility. Again, I said, by pride only comes contention. Now, pride brings strife. Why? Because uh, egos are both requiring that the other person respect them and uh, acknowledge them as being right. And frankly, if you're humble, you might acknowledge that you're not always right. And even if you are right on this occasion, it may not be that they have every reason to know that you're right. And it might offend you, your pride, that they don't know you're right. That, you, that they don't know you're smarter than they are. Or that you're more honest than they are, or whatever. But being humble in relationships means that you will honor the other person. In Romans 12, 10, Paul said, uh, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor, giving preference to one another. Honor the other person more. 
than yourself. Now, I have to say, there's people that we might realize that we should honor, but we can't because they're not honorable. And I remember somebody telling me this about his wife, that uh, she was uh, behaving very dishonorably, and she was an embarrassment and ashamed of the family. And, uh, and he said, God, how can I honor my wife? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, men on, give honor to your wife as to the weaker vessel. He said, how can I honor my wife when she's not honorable? And he said, the Lord said to him, you honor her not because she's honorable, but because you honor me by honoring her. When you honor her, you honor me because I want you to do it. And you humble yourself and give honor to the other person, whether they deserve it or not. Because if you don't, you're not honoring God. If you don't love your neighbor who you've seen, how can you love God whom you've not seen? If you don't honor them when God tells you to, then you're not honoring God. Remember, Jesus said in John chapter 5, he says that everyone ought to honor the Son even as they honor the Father. And he said, he that does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Well, you can't honor God if you don't honor Jesus because God wants you to honor Jesus. And if you don't, then you're not honoring God. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul said, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. That's pride there. But in lowliness of mind, that's humility, let each esteem others better than himself. That's what humility is. You're going to offend a lot fewer people if you're esteeming them better than yourself. Now, to esteem them better than yourself doesn't mean you really think they are truly better people than you are. Sometimes you'd have to engage in self-deception to think that. A lot of people are not as good as you are, and you're not as good as some others are. And it's irrelevant. It's not our place to be deciding, where do I stand on the hierarchy of, the, of superiority in terms of this person or that person? I'm probably better than some, but I know some are better than me. Where am I? That's not even for me to consider. That's pride. Mm -hmm. Humility says, I'll just assume them as if they're better than me. I don't know that they're not. I know how wicked I am. I know how many things there are about me that people don't see. They probably have about as many things I don't see. I'll just, like God says, honor them above myself, esteem them better than myself. If, I'm, if I get it wrong, I've, I've really lost nothing by obeying God in this. Humbling myself, there are very few relationships that cannot be improved by both parties just being more humble. And, uh, you know, esteeming the other better than themselves. And then this next verse in Philippians 2, and the last one we'll look at here, is he says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. This is talking about, this is what love looks like. You're deferring to the other person. Of course you have your interests, and they are in conflict with other people's interests, obviously. Whenever you give to the poor, their interest in your money is in conflict with your interest in your money, right? I mean, your interest in your money is that you can use the money for what you would like to have. They have an interest in your money. They have no right to it, by the way. But you are a merciful and compassionate person, if you're a Christian, and therefore you share with them. But they, you are honoring their interests above your own. And it's not just when you're giving money to the poor. It's when you're deferring to anybody. Whenever there's an argument that you could win, but it'll take a while for the other person, if ever, to recognize that you won, it's a good idea just to drop out and humble yourself and say, they're interested in being right, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give them that, I'll defer to that. Uh, it says in Proverbs, it's an, uh, it's an honor for a man to cease striving, but any fool can stir up an argument. Uh, it's an honorable thing to stop striving. Defer to the other person, let them have their point. It's our pride that makes us always want to be right, and it's that and, and the corresponding pride in the other person that causes unresolved strife to occur. Because we know we're right, and they know they're right. And we know they're not, and they know we're not. In other words, it's unresolved who's right and who's not. And until we can say, well, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to, have to live in peace and, and love each other, 
without knowing who's right. Or even if I'm pretty sure you're wrong and I'm right, that's not a reason for me not to esteem you better than myself, to in honor, in honor prefer you, to look out not for my own interests but yours. The, this is how relationships have got to be conducted. Now, the Bible has special instructions for a whole lot of different kinds of relationships. Our relationships with our parents, our children, our spouses, our neighbors, our enemies, the church, the government. The Bible has specific instructions on all of these relationships, and they're not all the same because, obviously, the expectations and obligations are different in different relationships. So we're going to, uh, over the next few times that we meet here, uh, go through this general subject of relationships and see uh, how it is that God wants us to behave differently and to uh, relate differently and to cultivate the kind of community among ourselves because of it that is what the church originally was and is still supposed to be.